I realised um, from sitting uh, yesterday, sitting at the very back, that um, if you're at the back, you can't really see any of the things at the bottom. So once I got back from the pub last night, I spent a lot of time moving everything up to the top so everyone can see it all, um, or just about everything. Anyway, I'm Alistair Dunning, Program Manager at something called the European Library. Right, we'll start with an interactive thing. Um, if you know what these terms are, if you understand them, please put your hands up if you feel confident about them. A wee bit. If you know some of them, just put your hand up a wee bit. Oh, that's good. That's a good start. Okay. Um, when I left JISC um, at the um, start of the year, um, oh, I don't know why that's gone upside down. Um, uh, I did not know much about the European scene. <laughs> Um, I said it was when I came back from the pub. <laughs> and, uh, that's um, some unexpected comedy. Um, when I started, I had very little knowledge of the things that were in that previous slide. I was um, somewhat of an innocent moving into uh, the European scene, as, as Janet said. And, uh, of course, my um, timing was absolutely um, exquisite for starting working in the European context just as the um, Eurozone uh, goes in a particular direction. Um, and does it not say on the agenda, Alistair Dunning, um, Europeana? And do I not work in the European offices in the National Library of the Netherlands? There's something seems a bit strange there. And all these names, Europeana, the European Digital Library, the European Library, um, it was very confusing for me. It's very confusing for you about what they all do. And so the first part of my presentation is just going to hopefully explain some of the differences and make some of their clarity over something that's a little bit confusing. And um, you can, um, there you go, yeah. Some of the projects, there's also other projects in uh, within the uh, European context. Um, European Film Gateway is something you may have heard about, European Inside, European Fashion. Um, European cheese is the other one out. It doesn't exist, but it could exist. And um, <laughs> yes, again, um, that says uh, links to interesting projects, but it's gone upside down again. I really, really wasn't that drunk. <laughs> I don't know what's happened. Anyway, um, so let me explain something about what these different things and different projects are. Um, first, a little side point, though. If anybody is ever, ever putting an online resource and digitizing something, and this is what they didn't think about in Europeana, is you should read this report from UCL, Claire Work, Department of Information Studies in 2006, what's in the name? And it's very good at saying, if you want people to use your resource, give it a very clear name that they understand immediately. That's a side note. Anyway, what is Europeana? Okay, Europeana is at the center of a large ecosystem of various projects, some at national level, some at international level, various services and aggregators um, which are dealing with digitizing cultural heritage them and giving them to some European app, which sits in the middle. Each of these projects and aggregators collects uh, metadata and sometimes actual digital content relating to European um, cultural heritage. And all of these projects and aggregators that have this name Europeana are involved in uh, taking this metadata from cultural heritage institutions and mapping it to something called the European Data Model, which is a, a very um, broad-reaching data standard to do with lots of different types of uh, content and um, then harvesting it by Europeana. Um, it's perhaps easier to think about it in this um, simple way. You have lots and lots of um, archives, national aggregators, libraries, all around Europe, and you have Europeana in the centre. Very simplified view of what Europeana does in terms of harvesting metadata from all these different um, sources. Um, now, originally, the original idea of Europeana was to provide a European version of Google. So it goes. That's the story that Jack Chirac himself said, we need to have something that competes with Google. Obviously, that is a completely um, ridiculous idea. So Europeana isn't so much about providing a, a competitor cultural heritage view to Google, and um, it's much more about uh, CC0, linked data, and its APIs. So European recently released around 22 million records relating to digitized content as CC0 from around Europe. And so <coughs> that's what it's really focusing on, on that linked data store, and also its APIs as well, 
and there are various kind of labs that they're building, build, excuse me, building up um, to get people to work at kind of business to business level rather than business to consumer level and to exploit those APIs to use these 20 million records and build interesting apps on top of them for cultural heritage, for tourism, for secondary school education, for research, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And it's all part of European, it's all part of this something called the EU digital agenda to pr promote creativity and growth. And a lot of the um, messages that come down from the EU itself about what European should be doing should be about how can you inspire growth and creativity. And it's not about creating European and creating apps and content themselves, but it's about letting other people to do that. Um, but to do this, to make sure European needs to work, it needs to maintain that ecosystem that aggregates all that messaging. So it's not just about European at the middle, but it's also about all of the kind of aggregators and projects that build into that, that create that large collection of linked data in the middle. Um, and so uh, related to that, and this is where I move into the European library, um, is uh, the, the, the kind of viewpoint for the library, how the library is built into European. You see European at the, at the side, and where I work here is something called the European library, and that deals with lots of national and research libraries across Europe. What makes it confusing apart from the name? Well, the, the fact is that I actually work in the same office as everyone who works in the European, the European the team, and it confuses things even more. So I work in the National Library of the Netherlands in The Hague, and that's where the European office is, and that's also where the European, um, library, um, European library is as well. So that's, I've explained a little bit about European and its ecosystem. I'm now going to speak a bit about the actual European Library and the relationship um, to libraries. And then, in actual fact, the European Library, hopefully in blue here, European is in red, just to help, um, is a part of this ecosystem. It's actually a little older. The European Library has been going um, since the 1990s. Various projects have been about, brought together largely around the Council of European National Libraries, um, which have brought together um, a shared catalogue of the European bibliography. Um, it started off with, I think, the British Library, the BNF in France, and the Germans, and then gradually it's extended out. And we, the European Library is now a shared catalogue of 48 national libraries around um, Europe. And in actual fact, the European Library acted as a forerunner of Europeana. So a lot of the staff that were in the European Library at the, at the start then went on to kind of develop the idea of the European Library. Um, and just some of the things that the, the kind of basic things that the European Library does is it's um, taking the bibliographic data sets from 48 national libraries and makes them um, interoperable. And that's a challenge in itself when you have different languages and different typesets and putting aside all the, the political differences that you might get um, within Europe. And it's also, I should point out, that it's not um, EU, it's, it's European in the sense of the Council of Europe, which is a much broader set of every country in Europe. So that's everyone apart from Belarus. And we're not really working in them. Um, and what we do is we, we ingest the metadata also for digital content. And we have a clustering workflow which identifies similar works between um, different national libraries. And we take that data set and we enrich it via VF and other types of sources. And then we make that data set um, available to um, other providers, um, ex libris, um, summon, et cetera, et cetera. But what we also do um, is offer a portal that allows people to search over this European bibliography. And um, we have an API that gives access to this, I say content, but it's actually the metadata, and allows people to search over it. And next year, we will be releasing an open data set of about 120 million bibliographic records a CC0, which is part of that uh, national bibliography or that shared European catalogue I was talking about. Um, and the European Library also works on several projects as well. So we've got that key thing in the middle of a European bibliography, um, but we also have various projects as well. Um, a few of them here are uh, of interest. And Dari, um, I mentioned before in tweets, is doing a lot of work with special collections around Europe. And um, DigiCore is with the Open University, and that's about tracing citations in full text open access repositories. And this is also a very interesting project as well, European and newspapers, and um, that's aggregating full text of historic newspapers from around Europe, um, around 30 or 40 million pages, and then trying to bring them together, full text aggregation. 
um, which will be useful not just for search and discovery, but also in a digital humanities sense. What can you do with the big corpus of uh, digitised newspapers? And other projects that we are working on, um, Regia, the medieval manuscripts, um, we've had one working with research libraries and bringing research library content to Medicate into European Library. And this is also um, deeply dull, but quite important one, the Arrow Plus project, um, which is about um, tracing copyright holders um, amongst um, uh, in Europe, if you're doing book digitization. Because we have the European bibliography, we're a good place to start if you want to do um, arts copyright search. Um, and the French government is just paying the BNF in Paris to start a huge project to digitize all French arts copyright books. Um, and they're starting with us in terms of how do they trace the copyright holders and how do they discuss which books are out of copyright. And that's partially based around this arrow, arrow system which we've been involved in. Um, and uh, a third uh, slide relating to some projects we're starting. We're about to start um, a new project, Europeana Cloud, um, which is building an infrastructure to kind of share metadata and content between um, different uh, communities and different types of research providers within, within Europe. That's just about to start this year. So as well as that um, sense of bringing that bibliography together, we are also about um, projects as well. So the focus has really been on, from the start, the focus has been on metadata from national libraries. Um, but what we now want to do, and what we've already kind of started on in one sense, is to try and work with research libraries to do similar things, to aggregate metadata, and also content as well, make it available um, in different ways, give it to different providers, link it up, enhance it, put it in our portal, put it in our API, link data, and then also um, work in projects um, as well. And we've had some informal discussions with um, RLUK, very informal so far, about possibly um, joining up as members. Um, the European Library is not a free service, it's not funded by the EU, um, it's actually funded by all the libraries who are members of it. So each of the national libraries pays something between uh, 500 euros and up to 50,000 euros for the very big ones to be um, members. We're also looking for um, individual research libraries to become members, or it would be much, much more cost efficient for a consortia to join as well. And there's some of the details about what that might actually mean and how we actually share content and metadata would still have to be worked out. And the prices would be much lower than they are for the national libraries because we're trying to bring all the prices down. So it'd be around, um, uh, if it was a, if it's kind of the bottom one, if it was a consortia, it probably would be around a thousand euros per library that was a member of that consortia. Um, but all that kind of has to be um, worked out and discussed a bit more. But we are very interested in seeing how um, the RLUK could be, become a member or the libraries could become members. And I think part of the reason why is because, well, hopefully we want to share metadata um, and all kinds of content in different formats in different ways. What I think we're also increasingly looking at is how we expose hidden collections. So part of what the task of the European Library is and how that relates to Europeana is to really expose in collections uh, metadata and the digitized collections that go with that and do that at European level and try and match up different collections from different countries that might be of interest to researchers and what uh, researchers are interested in. Um, and also we're looking into the possibilities for aggregating full text. Uh, there's been more and more discussion of the relationship between libraries and uh, digital humanities and also digital social sciences and possibly other subject areas as well. But when you have the chance to aggregate on a large European level, then the possibilities for creating new data sets, the possibilities for creating new corpora, both based on metadata and full text content, offer some intriguing new um, research possibilities. And that's part of the things that we're looking into with that European Cloud project I mentioned, are in what you can do when you have large scale full text aggregations across um, Europe. Um, and I think it's also being part of a member of TEL is offer, uh, the European Library is offer also a chance to um, highlight a collecting institution as well. And we're also in discussion with ABES, the French Library Consortium at the moment, and they have um, a rather scary 140 libraries that um, they would like to sign up to the European Library. And one of the rationale why they do that is not just talking about the collections 
within those libraries, but how those collections relate to the actual institutions or university libraries themselves. And that's in the negotiations with Abbas, that's one of the things that keeps on coming up. And also, finally, I think one of the most interesting reasons why uh, RLUK may be interested in joining up with European libraries is also a method of participating in um, EU projects, of getting kind of a bit more leverage into the funding that's available within the EU. Um, there's something that's going to be called the Connecting Europe facility, which aims to provide around 300 million euros in funding for the European ecosystem. So go back to that original slide I had of European and then all the aggregators around it from um, 2014 to 2020. So that will be significant funding for digital, well, digital cultural heritage, really digital library projects, and will be under that Connecting Europe facility. Um, at least that was the idea. The one um, problem that we have at the moment, of course, is how much money each of the national governments decide to give to uh, the European Union. So that figure of 300 million I mentioned before, it may not be quite as big as that in the future. Um, but certainly that's where a lot of the funding for digital libraries in the next five or six years um, is going to be. There'll be other places within the Horizon 2020 program that will have funding for um, digital libraries and work for research projects, but this is one to pay attention to. And this is also one that um, the European Library is kind of very interested in working with because we have significant expertise in preparing and, and executing project proposals. We have six or seven projects on the go at the moment. Um, and there's also going to be another call next year, uh, 2013 PSP program, never mind the acronyms, which will also have funding for digital libraries. And I think, um, and one of the things that I'm thinking of there, just in reflection with the, the comment before, is that funding call may give an opportunity to build on the hidden collections report and some of the issues that we talked of before. Um, retro, tech, retro cataloging can be um, unattractive to, fund, to, to funders, but there's a possibility, I think, within that call I just mentioned to look at some of the technologies to create and enhance metadata, particularly in some of the linked data and semantic stuff. And of course, a pan-European approach is always attractive to other funders as well and to your um, seniors as well within each of your institutions. And just saying the same thing again. So just to um, conclude, um, the European Library, um, it's not a huge organization. There's about 10 or 12 of us who have a specific role within the European Library. But we do have a particular role in aggregating, presenting, and distributing content from national libraries and also research libraries, and doing that, uh, sharing that data, enriching that data, and doing it at an international level. And we want to do that with both services and projects. So that's all for me. I hope at the end that you're a little more clear about some of the things that Europeana and the European Library does, and that there are a few more hands can at least be put up in your mind, if not in the space. Thank you.